I've wanted to say a few things to Christian Saunders before, but this particular video that just came out, Learning is Useless, sort of put me over the edge and now I just can't resist. goodness, you caught me playing with a liver. <laughs> you caught me playing with a liver. Listen, let's talk. Do you ever have multiple contradictory feelings at the same time? I think we all do, right? But what about this? Have you ever heard someone speak and you wholeheartedly and enthusiastically agree with some of the things they have to say. And at the same time, they say other things that you completely disagree with or even find nonsensical. It's a very strange sensation to completely agree and completely disagree with someone at the same time. And so I have so many things to say about Christian's video that I decided to record a response to it. Now, I think the clash of ideas can be intellectually stimulating, and I don't want to insult anyone. So there are going to be some moments as we go through this video when I will have strong reactions. In the moments when I have naturally strong reactions against some of the things that Christian says in this video, my plan is to try to pull myself back from those reactions and instead of reacting, I will try to respond thoughtfully. So that's my plan. Wish me luck. Oh, and Christian. Hi, Christian. Greetings from Texas. Let's take a look at your video and talk. This is you. In Reality, you are nothing but a skeleton covered in meat and skin. And inside that skeleton is the most important part of you. This. Not only is this the most important part of you, it is you. The idea that mind and body are two separate things has been around for thousands of years, but was made famous by the French philosopher René Descartes. For me, you're off to a good start because I also get a little annoyed with the idea of mind-body separation. So, so far, I'm with you, Christian, but let's go on. Many people dream that one day we can liberate ourselves completely from this meat machine and we can back ourselves up onto a computer and live forever in an eternal digital paradise. There's only one problem. <laughs> like a digital heaven, right? There's only one problem with all this. Let's find out what the problem is. We don't have a body. We are a body. I really like this point that you're making, and I completely agree with you. Yes, we don't have a body. We are a body. I think probably this idea has many sources. It comes from a lot of places. And part of it, I think, is maybe an optical illusion caused by the fact that, you know, we have eyes in our head. So as we walk around, we almost have the sensation of existing in our head, which is where we imagine our mind 
to be. As Sir Ken Robinson pointed out so charmingly, a lot of people seem to think that their body is just a way to get their heads to meetings. They look upon their body as a form of transport for their heads. <laughs> you know, it's... Don't they? It's a way of getting their head to meetings. <laughs> So yeah, this is an idea that definitely pervades a lot of thought. And I don't like it either. So right on, we're on the same page so far. Let's keep going. And we are not computers or machines. And misunderstanding this has a serious consequence when it comes to language learning. So far, we are totally on the same page. It tells us that learning is useless misunderstanding the mind and body as being separate leads us to conclude that learning is useless. Okay, I don't follow you, but maybe it'll make sense as you explain. To understand why this happens, let's start at the beginning with children. Let's start with two things that mind-body separation teaches us to believe about language learning. Okay, two things that mind-body separation teaches us to believe about language learning. You ready? The first thing is that children are better language learners than adults. Mind-body separation teaches us to believe that children are better language learners than adults. Okay, you're going to explain how, right? What could possibly be the reason for this? Well, it can't be a fault of the mind, because adult minds are better than child minds at almost every type of task. Okay, adult minds are better than child minds at almost every type of task. Now, task is a key word here, because... I would agree with you that adults tend to be a lot better than children at tasks, right? If we're defining task as a specific action that is focused and needs to be accomplished, that's what adults do, right? And children do something really different with their intelligence and their awareness. They're not really very task oriented, but that doesn't mean that they are less intelligent or that their minds are not as good as adult minds. Far from it. They have a different kind of awareness and they approach the world in a different way. So tasks, yeah, that's what adults are good at. But read the work of Alison Gopnik. She refers to the awareness of a child as a lantern. It illuminates all that surrounds it, right? It's, it's not excluding options. It is open to seeing and discovering and learning from whatever it comes in contact with. That stage in childhood where children have open awareness allows them to learn at an incredible pace and be open to many possibilities. And then they grow out of that and they grow into the adult phase. And one of the reasons that we need adults to be so focused and task oriented is to protect children who are these little scientists constantly experimenting with whatever they encounter. So we need the two types of consciousness in the human race. And one of the jobs of the task oriented phase is to protect the learner, discoverer, experimenter phase. So I wouldn't say that children's minds are better than adults' minds, but I definitely wouldn't say that adults' minds are better than children's minds. They have gifts that we've lost touch with, and they're beautiful, and they're completely necessary for the human race. Read Alison Gopnik. I'll put some links in the description. It's fascinating. An adult mind has better memory, better problem-solving skills. An adult mind has better memory. I'm not sure about that. I don't know where you're getting that better problem solving skills. Probably, probably when you define it very narrowly, but if you spend any time around children, you will notice that they are constantly posing and solving problems. That's 
how they learn to do everything. They take on challenges and create challenges for themselves continuously. So I don't know that adults have better problem solving capabilities. More knowledge about the world. Yeah, adults have, oh, wait, reacting. Okay, calm down. Yes. <laughs> Adults have more knowledge about the world. We've accumulated more knowledge because we've lived through more experience. I mean, obviously adults have more knowledge, but that doesn't mean we're more intelligent or have better minds. So it must be a body problem. The body has changed. You can't fight nature. Why even try? Okay, so your argument is that children are better language learners than adults, but adults have better minds. So what has happened to make these people with better minds less capable language learners? Oh, their bodies must have declined. That must be it. And so this is, this is a false belief arising from the mind-body dualism. But adults are bigger and stronger than children. I mean, if you're going to say adults have better minds, why wouldn't you also say that adults have better bodies. I don't know. This doesn't really make a lot of sense to me, but let's, let's just move on. So learning is useless. Learning is useless. You know, I think this is a good time to look up a really great word. This is a term that we don't need all the time, but when we do need it, it's just the right term for the job. We're going to look up the word non sequitur. I'm going to the learner's dictionary. Non sequitur, this is a Latin phrase. Sometimes we bring out Latin phrases to get fancy or sometimes because they have just that precise meaning that we need for the situation. Non sequitur, a statement that is not connected in a logical or clear way to anything said before it. So I think this is a great example of a non sequitur. But before we go on any further with your video, I would just like to point out that in order to have a meaningful conversation about learning, I think it would be a good idea to define what we mean by learning because the statement learning is useless is just so nonsensical. I mean, learning obviously is one of the most important and exciting, exhilarating and valuable activities that there is. And without learning, we would have nothing. And I was wondering if maybe by learning, you mean studying or teaching? Like maybe what you want to say is studying is useless or teaching is useless. And I could get on board with arguments for those two cases, but learning is useless. I don't know. You'll have to define learning, <laughs> right? Okay, let's go on. The second thing is that we believe that we are all born with a language instinct. I think that actually most people don't believe we're born with a language instinct. I think the popular wisdom is more that language is a cultural construction that's passed down from generation to generation that's basically taught um, like a cultural artifact. But I think it's a lot closer to the truth to call language an instinct, though I do not believe that that is popularly understood. Apart from the profoundly disabled, all children will learn to speak a language. Yes, that's right. Apart from the severely disabled, all children will learn to speak a language. That's true. They will. <laughs> the same way that all children learn to walk. Yes. And to eat. Yes. That's something that we are born with, something in our nature, Yes. in our body. In our body? Yeah, of course it's in our body. I mean, everything is in our body, right? Yes, it's something in human nature. That's right. We're born with it. Absolutely true. And it happens whether we try or not. Yes, that's right. Children learning language do it naturally, automatically, and spontaneously. Absolutely true. It happens whether we try or not, whether somebody teaches us or not. Babies don't study. To learn a language, you must be immersed and not in a classroom. 
to learn a language, you must be immersed and not in a classroom. Well, everything you, that you said right before that was completely true. Language develops spontaneously in children. They don't need to study. Sometimes they do study and sometimes people do teach them language, but it's not necessary. Even if nobody teaches a child, the child still learns to speak and learns to speak an incredibly complex, rich human language. So that's something that happens spontaneously and you don't need to be in a classroom, but it's also possible to learn language in a classroom. So these aren't mutually exclusive, right? They're not mutually exclusive. You know that. Again, learning is useless. Okay, okay, here I think you definitely must mean studying in a classroom is useless. Yeah, not learning. <laughs> what you're meaning with the word learning here is studying. Studying in a classroom is useless, right? It makes me terribly sad to think that most people will never discover that both of those things are false. It makes you terribly sad. You don't look terribly sad to me. You look like you're being a provocateur. Uh, but now what about a person who's a provocateur? What about a person whose goal is to cause a reaction among the students? Anyway, you are about to tell us that both of these things are false. Let's see. The idea that children are better learners than adults was planted by Aristotle thousands of years ago. And Aristotle may have had something to say about it, but this is the basic observable fact of human existence. You are asking us to disbelieve our lifetime's worth of experience. You know, I think that it's time to look up another word. We're going to look up the word gaslighting and you know accusing you of gaslighting is a bit extreme but it what you just did actually reminds me of gaslighting because let me read part of this definition it's a psychological manipulation of a person usually over an extended period of time that causes the victim okay all of that's a bit extreme but here's the part that fits causes the victim to question the validity of their own thoughts perception of reality or memories. Okay, gaslighting is demanding that someone disbelieve the evidence of their own senses and the reality of their own experience. And the reality of all our experience is that children learn language automatically and spontaneously, whereas adults if we come to a language at a later stage in our development, that's not what happens. If we want to learn that language, we have to make a lot of effort and we are very unlikely to learn those deep rules that govern the language with the depth that a child learns them. So yeah, children are better language learners than adults and we all know that. And I really don't like it when someone demands or plans an idea that would cause us to disbelieve the evidence of our senses and our lived experience. Okay, let's go on. Modern research shows that adults are actually way better at language learning than children. children. Okay, so you are citing a paper some academics wrote in the early 2000s that says adults are better at language learning than children. And so I'm gonna say it's probably another case of severely circumscribing the language learning for this study. And of course there are language tasks, tasks again, keyword that adults are better at. Sure, adults are probably better at, I don't know, memorizing a list of vocabulary words, taking a multiple choice test, something like that, right? But children are better at actually learning language in the sense of learning it deeply and being able to use it. We all know this. Don't ask us to abandon what we know to be true just to follow your argument. And there is no language instinct. There is no language instinct. You are really self-assured. Let's see what you have to say to defend 
this statement. In Los Angeles in October 1970, a girl called Jeannie was rescued from her parents' house. Her parents had locked her in a room, tied to a chair, without human contact for more than 13 years. And apart from the physical and psychological damage, she had developed no language ability. So one severely, tragically abused child who was tied to a chair and locked in isolation from other humans didn't spontaneously develop speech? Well, then there can't be a language instinct. Is this the argument that you're making? This is really insulting to everyone's intelligence. No one would expect a girl to spontaneously develop language if she had never heard any, even without this type of extreme psychological abuse. I really don't understand how you can present this as evidence for your assertion that there is no language instinct. As the Encyclopedia of Infant and Early Childhood Development says, children raised without human interaction do not develop language. Obviously not. Obviously, children raised without human interaction are severely, okay, two things. They're severely abused. They cannot develop normally. Humans are social creatures. These children are going to be extremely damaged developmentally and psychologically. And hopefully there are very few instances of this. And if they don't hear language, no, they can't develop language. Language instinct doesn't mean that you develop language spontaneously without ever having heard any. That's not what it means to say that we have a language instinct. Children develop language spontaneously, but they develop it by taking in elements of their environment, the incomplete, imperfect samples of language in their environment they take all of this in and at, at a subconscious level, process all of this and distill out the rules and then operate from those rules. You know, as Noam Chomsky famously pointed out back in the 50s, I think, almost every human utterance is unique and has never been said by anyone before. So children are not just repeating what they hear. No, they are mining everything they hear for rules and patterns and then using those rules and patterns to produce original speech of their own. It makes me think of the time that my daughter was nursing. She was still nursing at two and she pulled off. I, I speak Spanish with my children. She pulled off and said to me because she had been pondering some things as she nursed. So she pulled off and asked me a question. Los fantasmas son mamíferos? <laughs> she was contemplating ghosts and wondering whether ghosts were mammals. Hey, Marcel, Josephine, te um, tengo una pregunta. Los, 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 los fantasmas son mamíferos. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, she had never heard this sentence before. She wasn't just repeating something she had heard. She was taking what she had extracted from her environment, combining it herself through this incredible capacity that humans have and creating a completely original construction. Let's go on. And this gives us our first insight into what really causes language learning. Not bodies, not minds, but people. How about bodies and minds? Because we already said that these are not really separable. And people. How about all three? Why does it have to be one or the other? It doesn't. You know, I think sometimes things are mutually exclusive. Yes. And some situations really are either or. But I think humans have a naturally sort of dualistic way of viewing things. 
And we have a tendency to look at things as black and white or either or, when often the real answer is not either or, but both, right? Yeah, this is a case where all of these are true. Language happens in the mind and body, which don't have to be viewed as separate. And it happens as part of the human experience. And we are a naturally social species and language develops in that context. And this is where we have to take a little detour into philosophy. Before we take the philosophy detour, detour into philosophy, philosophy detour. Before we take the philosophy detour, I, <laughs> I'm going to read you a little bit from the language, the language instinct. Uh, this book by Steven Pinker, I don't know if you've read it. I highly recommend it. It's intellectually invigorating and illuminating. And, you know, as you can see from the title, his thesis is that instinct is the best model for human language because it allows us to understand a lot about language. Okay. <clears throat> The language instinct. Listen to this. Language is not a cultural artifact that we learn the way we learn to tell time or how the federal government works. Instead, it is a distinct piece of the biological makeup of our brains. Language is a complex, specialized skill which develops in, this, in the child spontaneously without conscious effort or formal instruction, is deployed without awareness of its underlying logic. So he says that for that reason, some people have called language this, some people have called language that, but I, says Steven Pinker, I prefer the admittedly quaint term instinct. It conveys the idea that people know how to talk in more or less the same sense that spiders know how to spin webs. Web spinning was not invented by some unsung spider genius and does not depend on having had the right education, et cetera, et cetera. Rather, spiders spin webs because they have spider brains, which give them the urge to spin and the competence to succeed. And although there are differences between webs and words, I will encourage you to see language in this way, for it helps to make sense of the phenomena we will explore. And it's fascinating. The phenomena he explores in this book are really fascinating. Let's read on a little bit more. Language is no more a cultural invention than is upright posture. So yeah, Language is a part of being human that we were born with. It is in our makeup, just the same as our upright posture, right? Nobody teaches a child, a human child, not to walk like this, right? It's just part of who we are. It's part of who we are. So he goes on to talk about different animals with their incredible, mind-blowing, specialized abilities, you know, like bats navigating by sonar that's amazing or butterflies migrating ac across continents to find just that special spot these are you know seemingly miraculous abilities that no one taught these creatures language is our special ability as humans and he goes on to quote oscar wilde education is an admirable thing but it is well to remember from time to time that nothing worth knowing can be taught. So Oscar Wilde. And maybe that statement right there in that little quip from Oscar Wilde, which contains so much truth just in a witty package, maybe that's a little bit closer to what you're trying to say in this video. When you say learning is useless, maybe what you're trying to say is nothing worth knowing can be taught. In other words, if one person tries to impart something to the other person, it's bound to be incomplete and superficial. That real learning takes place by an internal drive. Maybe that's what you mean? 
I don't know. He quotes Chomsky also. It is a curious fact about the intellectual history of the past few centuries that physical and mental development have been approached in quite different ways. No one would take seriously the proposal that the human organism learns through experience to have arms rather than wings. In other words, we know that physical development is spontaneous. So why do we take a different view of mental development? He says, human cognitive systems when seriously investigated prove to be no less marvelous and intricate than the physical structures that develop in the life of the organism. So going back to your initial assertion, which I agree with that this mind-body dualism is actually an illusion or a fallacy, well, then take that and apply it to language. While we're on the subject of Chomsky, I just want to say, Noam Chomsky, I love you dearly, mostly for your activism and just for being who you are. Thank you for all of your contributions to humanity. And I want you to live forever. <sighs> okay. Now, the last sentence in chapter one of The Language Instinct, I'll read that and we'll put the book away. He says, the best place to begin is to ask why anyone should believe that human language is a part of human biology, an instinct at all. And then that's the place that he starts. Let's go on. getting to the point you really want to make, right? At some stage in your life, you might have been asked this question. If a tree falls in the forest and there is nobody there to hear it, does it make a sound? I like to see you smiling. It is now such a cliche that it's almost like a joke. I like to see you smiling and I like to see you out in nature and it really gives a nice change of pace in the video. If I write a book and nobody reads it, did I use language? Okay, so you're getting to your main point, which is basically that languages for communicating that's the main function of language is to communicate it's to put your ideas in the mind of another person and it's an amazing ability that we have and yes the primary purpose of language is for communicating and so maybe you're trying to say that if you if you go into your room close the door and study all by yourself maybe that kind of learning is useless if you never take what you've learned and apply it and, and put it to use in human communication. And I, I can agree with that. If I study language and I never use it, do I know that language? Sort of, but you don't know really how well you know it if you don't try it out and use it. The truth is that every act of language requires another person. No, that's not true. That's not true. Language is primarily for communicating. That's why it evolved, right? And that's, that's its power. That's, that's our superpower as humans is the ability to cooperate. And part of being able to cooperate is to share ideas and information and discoveries amongst ourselves and with each other. So it's humans ability to cooperate that has allowed us to basically dominate the world to the point where we are threatening all living systems. And it's this ability to cooperate through language that has allowed us to do this. But that's not the only use of language. I used to write a lot of poetry and it all happened in my mind. And I was never trying to get on stage or publish in a book. It was not about that for me at all. It was words bubbling up in me and coming out on the page an almost obsessive need to craft them into something that was pleasing to my mind and to my ear and didn't have anything to do 
with anyone else. So that's just one example that I personally have lived of how language doesn't have to be for communication. Although you're right, it primarily is. A book has no meaning until somebody reads it. You know, Kafka, Kafka never published any of his works and he asked for them all to be burned when he died, but his friends defied his wishes and published his works. And that's why we can all enjoy Kafka today. But for Kafka, we have to assume that there was a certain satisfaction in the process of writing just for himself, right? A joke isn't funny until somebody laughs. I laugh to myself all the time. A hundred years ago, the Russian psychologist Lev Vygotsky wrote that language was a unity of generalization and social interaction, a unity of thinking and communication. Languages that are not used by people are dead languages. Yeah, that's the definition of a dead language, one that's not used anymore. Living languages don't exist in recordings or on a page. Yes, they do. Living languages exist in lots of places, in people's mouths and also in recorded and written form. Living languages are transmitted from one person to another. In a sense, but the, the child, the learner, is the active party in that transmission. It's not really a transmission like a mama bird putting a worm into the beak of her baby bird. It is that child in a very active process taking in the odd bits and pieces of language in his environment and distilling from those the rules that he then uses to speak. Have you invested all your time and money and energy in a language that only exists here in your mind? Okay, so you're saying that if people study language, they should also be putting it into practice and use. Absolutely, right? That brings us to the most damaging part of the mind-body separation. That this organ, your brain, your mind, is a container. Or your head is a container. And it can be filled. Yes, I so enthusiastically and wholeheartedly agree with you. And this is one of the points that I have tried to impress on people, particularly people at my child's school, but also anybody who has anything to do with children, although it doesn't only apply to children, it applies to learners of all ages. But yes, this learner as empty vessel waiting to be filled model of education is harming us. Learner as a passive, empty vessel waiting to receive bit by bit by bit of information transmitted, there's that word again, by the teacher or the instructor. This is harmful because it fails to recognize the active role of the learner in constructing knowledge. And it tries to turn people into passive receptacles for their conveniently packaged bits of knowledge. And this sort of kills learning. It kills enthusiasm for learning. It's harmful. And so I completely agree with you. And this learner as empty vessel model of education has got to go. Got to go. It's got to go. Yes. It's got to go. Like an empty container. An empty container waiting to be filled. The Italian philosopher Umberto Eco called it the alibi Umberto. of photocopy. He said, there are many things that I do not know because I photocopied a text and then relaxed as if I had read it. Mm -hmm. Yes, we need as learners to be as active and engaged as possible. And as people who facilitate learning, we also need to 
view learners that way and not just blast them with information or see them as containers for little bits of information that we're going to drop in, but bring them into the process of discovery. It's messier, but it's authentic. So totally worthwhile, right? It's the only way to go, right? So I completely agree with you on that point. A massive difference between knowledge and knowing. And the process that converts knowledge into knowing is activity. It is your responsibility okay. to do that activity. <laughs> that is learning. We have. Okay, so that is learning. You just finally defined what learning is. So doing the activity that converts knowledge into knowing. Okay, let's go with that. That's learning. Well, okay, that's fine. At least you defined learning and learning for you is an active process of engagement that, that makes the material real, makes the knowledge real. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. So many misconceptions about being human. We can survive only with instinct, but everything that makes us truly human, the good and the bad, loving and fighting are all learned how can you make such a sweeping generalization with such utter self-assurance like where do you get this everything that makes us human is what did you say learned hold on a second i got i've got to back this up Five only with instinct, but you're saying only with instinct. You're like diminishing instinct, viewing language as an instinct or other elements of human nature as instinct does not diminish them. It gives us a chance to wonder at the complexity that is our genetic heritage. Everything that makes us truly human, the good and the bad, loving and fighting are all learned says who where do you get that everything that makes us truly human is learned that's just absurd to me <laughs> wait a second i wasn't supposed to react responding thoughtfully i thoughtfully say that's absurd to me <laughs> i'm sorry let's just go on okay including language Baby that walk have a higher language ability. Why? Because they experience more. Babies who walk have a higher language ability than babies who are too young to walk or than babies who never learn to walk, who clearly are disabled for some reason. We don't learn language because we want to. We learn language because we need to, because Without other people, we can't survive. Yeah. <laughs> That's as if babies made a strategic calculation to start babbling and exercising and exploring their speech organs before they can ever say a word out of some calculated self-interest. Well, I'd better learn to speak with human language because that's the way I'll survive. So ba ba be ba ba. No, I mean, come on. We do need language. That is how we've survived, you know, as these clawless, fangless, relatively weak animals. We've survived through cooperation. And a large part of that is language allowing us to do that. But that doesn't mean that individual humans learn language out of some strategic calculation for their own survival. We learn it because that's who we are. Babies babbling in the crib are doing the beginnings of it because that's who we are. It comes out of us spontaneously like song from a bird. Because we are not a mind and a body. We are somebody and soon will be gone. So don't waste it. Dramatic. 
but I like it. I like it. You know, what's life without a little drama? You know, I think you're a bit of an iconoclast, right? You like to tear down icons, institutions. Let's look up iconoclast, shall we? A person who criticizes or opposes beliefs and practices that are widely accepted. Yes, you're an iconoclast. And I love that. I love iconoclasts. I'm an iconoclast too. And a lot of common beliefs and practices need to be challenged and they need to be taken down. And I'm wondering if it feels a little strange to you as an iconoclast to have risen to this position where a lot of people revere you. What happens when an iconoclast rises to the level of a god? What happens when another iconoclast comes along? You make one extremely important point. Learners are not empty vessels. Learning should be active and engaged, and then it will be more deep and more authentic, right? So extremely important point. I'm in full agreement with you there. So why do you need to use all of that sloppy logic to get to that point? You know, a couple of people I know who really like you, and I think they like you for a good reason. I think that you're a good person and you're doing great things in the world. And you have your own style, you know, a little bit dramatic, provocative, and that's fine. Everybody has to have their own style. But a couple of people who are admirers of yours, when I had some reactions to this video, they told me, you know, Christian sometimes says things to be dramatic. You don't necessarily need to take everything he says literally. And it just occurred to me that Trump fans... <laughs> have often said the same things about Donald Trump. Don't take him literally. He's making a bigger point. So is that really how you want to use your platform? Because you have a lot of people who respect you and look up to you and you're doing good in the world. So maybe you would like to be a little more rigorous in the logic that you use. And yeah, when you say something, Shouldn't we be able to take it at face value? I don't know. My opinion is yes, we should. But you have your own style and you have your own thing. So that'll be up to you. Okay, now for everybody who, <laughs> for everybody who watched along, thanks for joining me. I feel a lot better because I, I had some really complicated feelings and I got them off my chest. So thanks for joining and uh, I would love to hear your thoughts. You probably have some opinions and observations of your own. Why don't you share them in the comments? I can't wait to hear what you say. Ah, uh, for people who haven't met me yet, my name is Dawn and uh, it's great to meet you. I hope to see you more in the future. But you know, Christian, I think that overall you and I have somewhat different styles, but we have a very similar iconoclastic approach. I think our biggest difference is probably <laughs> that we're very far apart on the hair spectrum. Other than that, I think we have a lot more similarities than differences. See ya.